So if you were here last week, we started uh, John chapter 4. And we started the, the story of the Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman. And if you remember in John 3, we had the unique opportunity to see Jesus' time in Judea. And John, John chapter 3, if, I, if I, I think, I'm pretty sure that it's the only part in the Bible that we see Jesus' time in Judea. Most of his time is in Galilee. And that's actually where Jesus was heading. He was in Judea, which was in the south, and he was heading to Galilee, which was in the north. But in order to get there, he had to go through Samaria. And a devout Jew of that time, and I remember Kishten shared with us a little bit about this last week, there, there was some beef. There was some uh, not very good, I don't know, what's the word? Beef. I like beef. I, I, y'all know what beef means. Okay. Uh, between the Samaritans and the Jews because, uh, because of the past that they had. And a devout Jew would actually go the long way around Samaria to go around it to, to, to totally avoid going through Samaria, even though that was the shortest route to get to Galilee. But we see Jesus has a purpose in going to Samaria, going through Samaria. And we see Jesus last week, he talks to the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he tells her that he offers living water that brings about everlasting life. And he tells her about everything she's ever done. And not only that, at the very end of what, what we talked about last week, Jesus is t telling her that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. So that's where we pick up this week in verse 47. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John verse four, or chapter 4, verse uh, 27. So we see Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, and then... The, his disciples, if you remember, were in a Samaritan village getting food to bring back to Jesus so they can eat. So th this is kind of where we pick up in verse 27. It says, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he, he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. So the first thing we see in verse 27 is the disciples were marveled that he would be talking to this woman. Because if you remember, Christian shared with us last week that it was taboo for a Jewish man to have a conversation, an extended conversation with a woman, much less a Samaritan woman because of the beef that was there between the two. And the disciples were surprised that he would be talking to, the, talking to this woman because culturally it was inappropriate. And, but we also see in the second part of verse 27, it says, Yet no one said anything. No one said, What do you seek or why are you talking with her? And I feel like that, that silence and them not saying anything to Jesus is them giving Jesus reverence. And they've learned already at this point that when Jesus is doing something, he's doing it for a purpose. He has a reason. And that reason will be revealed to them later on in this chapter. But I want to say this. Jesus isn't breaking a God's law when he's talking to this Samaritan woman or talking to a woman. He was breaking a man-made religious law from the Jews. And sometimes breaking a religious norm is necessary to reach people. And the Samaritans and the Samaritan woman is a great example of that. I know uh, in, when I grew up, I went to a church where you had to dress up. You had to wear ni a nice shirt, maybe even a tie, and have your shirt tucked in. You had to wear the shoes and everything. And, and don't hear me say there's something wrong with those churches, because God is moving in those churches and doing great things in those churches. But those churches couldn't reach everybody. So then became these churches that were breaking this religious norm, as you will, and they came and as churches what they called come-as-you-are churches. And I believe that here at CCF, we're, we're a come-as-you-are church because, as you can tell, I'm, I'm wearing sandals. I don't have my shirt tucked in. And you can basically come in as you are. And all of a sudden, all these people that were unchurched were all of a sudden coming to church and hearing the gospel and get, coming to know Christ. So sometimes it's okay to break a religious norm and that's what Jesus is doing here in breaking a religious norm to reach the Samaritan woman. But it's not, again, it's not against God's law. 
And then in verse 28, we see the woman left her water pot and went into the city. You know, this could probably, to the disciples, they're, they're probably looking at this Samaritan woman, talking to, talking to Jesus. First of all, they're marveled because Jesus is even talking to her. And then they see her, the reason why she comes to the, to the well is to get water and to bring back to her house so she would have water for the week or month or whatever. But this is, they probably mention this in this story because it's very strange. Like, she comes to the well and leaves her water pot. Like, why did you even come to the water pot? Or come to the well, I mean. So that's probably why uh, John even mentions it. But for the woman, she's so impressed by Jesus and so certain that she's going to come back to him that she leaves the water pot. And we see in verse uh, 29 what the woman goes back and, and she talks to. It's interesting to me that it says that he, she goes to the men. It's like, well, why isn't she going to the women? I mean, it doesn't say in there, but I can only imagine that the, woman, the women wouldn't talk to her. They probably knew of her past and probably wouldn't talk to her. So she goes to the men. And she says this in verse 29. Come, see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? See, Jesus so impressed this woman that she was compelled to tell those in her city that they should come to the well and meet Jesus. And she was so impressed and attracted to him, even though Jesus told her all the things she's ever did wrong, all all the things she's ever did. See, Jesus displayed so much love and such a sense of security that she felt safe with him, even though her sins were exposed. And... You know, I think there is a taboo, sometimes a, a taboo to, and a, and a feeling that, you know, only God can judge me. And I, I think it's okay to expose people's sins, but how are we doing it? You know, Jesus, Jesus here is obviously doing it in love. So as Christians, we, if we're going to expose someone's sins and, and confront somebody, we need to be doing it in love. And it's important for every follower of Christ to create a a safe place for people to seek forgiveness, repent, and then turn over over to God. See, the Samaritan woman was so impressed by the love of Jesus that even as he confronted her sin, that she forgot that she didn't want anyone else to remember about all the things she ever did. You know, I can just imagine being one of these men that she's going to and her saying this, and then they're just like taking it back because it's like, okay, you know, normally you don't talk about this stuff. Why is she talking about this? And then now all of a sudden she's saying that this, this person is possibly the Christ. And that would have probably had a light bulb go off in, in some of these men's heads because the Jews believed that one essential characteristic of the Messiah would be that he'd be able to tell all the secrets of, of a heart. And that's what this woman is saying that Jesus was doing. And that was actually predicted in the book of Isaiah. And if you remember last week, Kishan shared with us that the the men and the Samaritans was a mixture. They believed our God, but they also got intertwined and intermarried with other cultures, and they started believing other things besides our God. So it's not unreasonable to think that some of these Samaritans would also believe that exact same thing about the Messiah, that they would know our innermost secrets of our hearts. And that's proven by verse 30 when it says, Then they went out to the city and came to him. See, the woman's invitation was very effective. The people came when she told them who Jesus was and what he revealed about her life and the impact that their brief conversation had on her life. So, that, so that's just kind of sets the stage of what's going on. She, she's talking, he's talking to the Samaritan woman. She goes off, and then now we're at where the Samaritans are coming to Jesus. And then it, it kind of takes a, a sidebar, a side note, where while the Samaritans are coming to Jesus, Jesus takes the opportunity to teach his disciples the source of his, his, source of his strength and satisfaction. It says in verse 31, it says, In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat in which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So 
So again, the disciples were, went to Samaria, a Samaritan village, to bring back food for Jesus and them to eat. And the disciples were, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel this disciples. They were, they were looking out for Jesus. They were looking out for his best interests. They knew that, that a body needs substance to survive. We need food to survive. So it was, they were rightly confused when, Je, when Jesus says, I have food to eat in which you do not know. But Jesus was talking about stuff, about spiritual things. Jesus wasn't saying that food and drink and rest were not important. Instead, he wanted his disciples to know that life was more than those things, that man does not eat by bread alone. So, they, so that's why he says, I have food to eat which you do not know. And in those words, Jesus is revealing his strength and also the weakness of his disciples. And he says, this, this is the food that he's talking about in verse 34. It says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, Jesus had a, great, a greater source of strength and satisfaction than the food he ate. Jesus was explaining to his disciples that his true satisfaction was to do the will of God and Father. You know, Jesus, his primary focus wasn't on the work. His primary focus wasn't on the strategy. His primary focus wasn't on the techniques or even the, the needy people around him. His primary focus was doing the will of his Father, the will of God, the will of him who sent me, as it says. And I think today we get consumed and our primary focus it gets on the needs. You know, I need to prepare, prepare for this Sunday's message. I need to prepare for Celebrate Recovery on Tuesday. I need to meet with this person or I need to go there. But it's the, my, my primary focus in all those things needs to be the will of God. Because I think if my primary focus is on all these things, then I can get burned out real easily, and I can get tired and weary. But if my focus is primarily on God's will, that, like Jesus is saying, it gives you strength, and it gives you, it gives you encouragement, and it helps us sustain us. And... I mean, I think all of us here would say that, you know, I want to, I want to do God's will. I want to do God's will. But do you really? I, I saw a, as I was preparing for this message, I listened to a David Gusick's message on, on this very, these very uh, uh, verses. And he, he actually gave a story that I wanted to share with you guys. It was, it was Christmas time, and there was a grandmother and a granddaughter. And the grandmother gives a present to the granddaughter. And the granddaughter opens the present, and it's a pin cushion. And a pin cushion is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a cushion, probably the, si the size of my hand, and it has pins in it. So the next day, uh, the, girl, the little girl's mother says, I need you to, uh, you need to write your thank you letters to, to the people who gave you Christmas gifts. So she gets to her grandmother's gift and, and says, thank you, grandmother, for the pin cushion. I've always wanted a pin cushion, but not very much. And I think that's how we are with God's will sometimes. But we want God's will, but not very much. You know, we feel that God's will for our life is something that we wouldn't want, and it wouldn't satisfy us. And Spur Spurgeon puts it this way. It says, The man of the world think that if he could have his own way, he would be perfectly happy, and his dream of happiness in this state or the next is comprised of this that his own wishes would be gratified, his own longing fulfilled, his own desires granted to him. And this is a mistake. A man will never be happy in this way. And I think that's so true. I think we, we, as the human race, try to satisfy ourselves with material things, with success. But then one day you lose your job and, you're not, and it doesn't bring that satisfaction anymore. Or we try to find satisfaction in a relationship and that relationship doesn't work out and we're not satisfied anymore. So, I mean, you could fill in the blank there of, of things of this world that, that aren't, aren't uh, always going to be satisfying. But Jesus is saying that doing the will of God is always satisfying. He's even saying that doing the will of God is, is better than a good meal. And I don't know about you, but I love a good meal, especially when I, when I haven't eaten all day, and then I have that nice, juicy hamburger, and then my body's like, oh, 
You know, I love this, uh, you know, I love that feeling of feeling satisfied by a meal. But Jesus is saying it's even better than that because, you know, I'm going to get hungry again, right? That's not going to satisfy me forever. See, Jesus found great satisfaction in doing the will of God. And doing the will of God, spiritually speaking, refreshed Jesus and strengthened him in ways that his disciples did not know. You know, how many of you are going to watch the finals of the, uh, of the World Cup or have been watching the World Cup? You know, I, I, I was thinking about this and I was like, it's kind of like watching a game of soccer or watching a game of football, as they would say here in St. Kitts. You know, the most exciting part about football, at least for me, is when my team that I want to win gets close to the goal. Then, you're, you know, your heart starts beating faster and you get really exciting. And then they score the goal and it gives you a new sense of strength and you're ready for the, for the, for the team to score the next goal. And I feel like that's kind of like doing God's will. That it, when you get close to the goal, it kind of gives you a little bit more energy. And when they score, you get this strength and gives you satisfaction that, that your team has scored. But, but that's not all that God, God says, or Jesus says. He says that food is to do the work of God and to finish his work. And if you, if you take it back to our, our soccer analogy, like it's satisfying to see your team score, but the ultimate satisfaction is to see your team win and move on to the next level. And that that's, would be like finishing the work. And we see an aspect of this, of Jesus finishing his work with, with the Samaritans, with the Samaritan woman as the chapter unfolds. But ultimately, this is the same wording he uses when he's on the cross and says it's finished. Because ultimately, Christ uh, doing the will of God, finishing his work, was finished when he died on the cross for you and I, for our sins, so we could be forgiven and that we can have a relationship with God. So in verse 35, uh, Jesus takes another opportunity to teach his disciples about the urgency of spiritual work and the opportunity. And he says this, Do you not say that there is still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they are ready, already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruits for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that in which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So the first thing we see here in verse 35, he says, there is still four months, and then comes the harvest. And he's mentioning this because it's, it's it was a proverb with the idea that, no, that you sh there is no particular hurry for a task because things simply take time and, can and you can't avoid the waiting. But Jesus is telling his disciples that he, did they didn't he didn't want his disciples to have that kind of mentality. He wanted them to have the mentality that the harvest was ready now. And that's why he says in, in, the, in the second part of verse 35, he says, Lift your eyes up and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. See, Jesus is using this idea of food and harvest to tell us spiritual things, to communicate spiritual ideas. The idea of the harvest meant that there were many people ready to be received into the kingdom of heaven and that the disciples needed to be ready to reap, to be the workers in that harvest. And there's a, a, a church leader who, who pointed out, he says, As he was speaking, the Samaritans were leaving the town and coming across the field toward him. And the eagerness of the people, the Jews regarded as alien and rejected, show that they were like grain ready for harvest. See, the fact that these people that didn't like the Jews were coming to see Jesus kind of just proves that they were ready to be coming to the family, ready to be uh, saved by Jesus. So Jesus warns his disciples not to think that there are still four months and then comes the harvest. And if they had eyes to see it, the harvest was ready, even white, for harvest. And if you think of wheat or grain, when it's, when it's ready to be picked, it's white. So that's why he's saying it's white for harvest, that it's ripe. It's ripe to be picked or maybe even overripe. So he's painting this picture for his disciples. And... We should also believe this. We should also believe that 
the uh, wheat or the grain is ready to be harvested. Because there's also people that need hope and need uh, Jesus Christ in their lives. And we should be also be uh, willing to share the hope we have in Christ and the power of our testimony. And we'll see the power of a testimony later on in this verse, the, the testimony of the, of the woman, of the Samaritan woman. And it also benefits. In verse 36, he says, He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruits for eternal life. That both he who sows and who reaps, and he who reaps may rejoice together. See, Jesus is encouraging his disciples and he's encouraging us. First thing he says is he's saying that their work in the harvest will be rewarded. And we're going to be rewarded for the work we do in the harvest. It's when he says, He who reaps receives wages. And the second thing is the good of their work will, will last forever. That's when he says that gathering fruit for eternal life. Because like, like we say at Celebrate Recovery, when someone comes to Christ, we say, welcome to the forever family, because we're going to be forever family on earth and in eternity in heaven. And the last thing that we can take courage, be encouraged about is every worker in the har- harvest will rejoice together in the work. There's people that plant the seed, there's people that water the seed, and there's people that harvest the seed. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 8, Paul says this, says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his reward according to his own labor. So if you are in the the business of, of planting the seeds, or you're in the business of watering the seeds, and you don't see the increase, don't get discouraged. Because that's not your job. That's God's job. God gives the increase. And we can, and we can all rejoice together when someone eventually comes, comes to know Christ. And I, I can just picture this, that you know, I'm, I planted a seed in someone long ago, and then they maybe moved to another state or another country, and I didn't, never saw them again. And then I die, and I go to heaven, and I see them there. But I also see the other people who, who watered the watered the seed and the people who actually got to reap the seed and we rejoice together because we because this person's come to Christ and they're there with me in heaven that's that's the kind of the image that I see when when I read that that passage and then oh, let me, sorry I've got I've, Skip the page. There we go. Okay. Skip the verse, I mean. In verse 38, it can be a very confusing verse, especially if it's taken out of context. But that's why I'm glad that our church does uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse because it kind of helps us put this verse in context. Because in verse 38, it says, I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. See, the disciples can now reap a harvest immediately, a, har- a harvest that they had, that had no part in laboring. And if you remember in John 1, it was John the Baptist who was planting the seeds, who was sowing, and it was Jesus Christ who was sowing. And we see Jesus sowing the seed in the Samaritan woman. And, that, and, and now the disciples are having the opportunity to, to reap what they did not sow. And that's how it is sometimes, uh, a lot of times, how it works in God's plan. That one sows and another reaps. So then, that's, that's Jesus giving these lessons to his disciples. And it's good that he's doing this because all of a sudden, now here comes the Samaritans. So enter the Samaritans in verse 39. It says, And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the words of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritan, Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with, with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own words. And they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So we see that the, the Samaritans 
uh, they believe because of the testimony of the woman. Initially, they believed because of what this woman told them. And at that moment, they didn't know enough about Jesus. They didn't know about the work he did, on, he, he did on the cross, but they most certainly could believe that he was the Messiah from God. And, he, and they did believe because, again, the word that the Samaritan woman testified of Jesus. And her testimony was that he told me everything I've ever did. See, the woman was so amazed, not only that Jesus knew the facts of her life, but he loved her even while knowing the facts of her life. You know, and we talked about, a couple weeks ago, we talked about fear, if you remember that. And we sometimes fear that if someone knew all that we ever did, that they would, they would not love us. But that's not the character of Christ, and that's not what we see here in this story. Christ knew everything that the Samaritan woman ever did, yet he still loved her. And he still loves us, and he knows, don't, I mean, we can't kid ourselves, he knows all of our things, all the hidden things, all the, all, the, all the sins in our lives, he knows, but he loves us anyway. It's his reckless love like we sang about this morning. So the Samaritans ask him to stay with them, and he stays with them two, two days. And this was remarkable in light of the opinions of uh, the Jewish people toward the Samaritans. And like I said, a devout Jew would go around Samaria. They wouldn't, they wouldn't dare even, they, wouldn't, they would, might go through it, maybe, but they wouldn't dare stay there an extended amount of time. And we see Jesus doing this. And for the Samaritans to even ask Jesus, a Jewish leader, to do this showed that he had their confidence and that they weren't afraid of him, the differences that he may have with them. You know, and our church slogan is it's not a religion, it's a relation, it's about a, it's not about a religion, it's a, it's a, 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 a sorry, it, it's not about a religion, it's a relationship. And Jesus here is a great example of this because he chose to stay with them two extra days. I mean, I, I can only imagine that if Jesus chose to leave, that he couldn't have had the same impact he did by choosing to stay and cultivate a relationship with them. And we know that because verse 41 says, many more believe because of his words. If he didn't stay an extra two, two more days, then he couldn't have spoken the words that he spoke, and they wouldn't have believed. And because he stayed two more days, in verse 42 it says, We know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. They didn't have to believe the Samaritan woman because they heard his very words, and they believed it for himself, that he was indeed the Christ and the Savior of the world. And it's amazing that they called him the savior of the world because he wasn't just the savior of the Jews. He wasn't just the savior of the Samaritans. He wasn't just the savior of one group of people. He was the savior of the world. He's a savior for everybody. He's a savior for me. He's a savior for you. And the title savior of the world was, of course, prompted by him staying this extra two days with them and cultivating this relationship and this is why we send missionaries all over the world because the world needs to know the Savior of the world. They need to know Jesus Christ. And I've talked to uh, several people here in St. Kitts and I, and I would say, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he's the Savior of the world? And they say, yes. And then I ask them, well, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are, are you a Christian? And they say, no. And how, how sad is that to believe intellectually that Jesus is the Savior, but not have Jesus as the Savior of your life? Because that's what really matters. What really matters is, is he the Savior of your life? Is he your Savior? Intellectually, you can believe that, but what really matters is if you believe he's the Savior of your life, the one who rescues us. And what do you need rescuing from? I mean, you tell me. I mean, I could tell you probably scripturally, look in the scripture, what we all need rescuing from. But w within yourself, you know what you need rescuing from. And I know that because in Proverbs 20, verse 27, and this is the Good News translation, it says, The Lord gave us mind and conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. 
We can't hide from ourselves. So let's get raw and real. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Then come to Jesus. Get away with him and he will recover your life. And don't take my word for it. Do as the Samaritans, we see the Samaritans do. Spend some time with Jesus in prayer and spend some time in, in God's word to, and you'll find out that God loves us. He loves us so much. We read in uh, first John, or John 3.16 that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us so much that he showed us his reckless love. So don't take my word on it. Study the word in prayer and you'll find out his love and that he wants to forgive you. He desires to forgive you of all your sins. And that because that's what Christ came to do. He came to be the savior of the world. You know, he longs to for you to come to him for forgiveness. He longs for you to uh, to sustain you by having a relationship with him and doing God's will. And he longs to be your savior. So I'm going to play uh, one more song for, for everybody. And during this time, just focus on God's will for you. You know, maybe you're like the Samaritan woman. And there, God's telling you something in your conscience or in your mind or in your heart that you need to seek forgiveness for. So take this time to, re, to seek forgiveness from our Lord, from Jesus, because he wants to forgive you. Or maybe uh, you're like the, uh, the, the disciples, and God, and God is putting on your heart to sow or to reap and to tell people about your testimony and tell people the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're like the, the, Samaritan, the Samaritans who come to Jesus and you just simply need to spend time with Jesus to understand that he loves you and that he is the Savior of the world and he is the Christ. So just take this time to do those things as I, we play this last song and I'll, I'll come up and, um, and I'll pray after the song.
will do the same with all my heart I give you glory the sun moon and stars shout your name they give you Father, I just thank you. Thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us. Thank you for stories that we read in the Bible, like this story of the Samaritan woman, and it just shows your reckless love and the extents that you're willing to go to reach a, a group of people and to reach us. And I thank you that you overcame so we can overcome. And Lord, I, I just pray that if there's people in here that, that uh, want, want forgiveness, that they, can co they come to you because you are, are the offerer of forgiveness. And I pray that if there's people in here that, that you're putting on their hearts to share their, their testimony or share the hope that they have in you, God, I just pray that you give them boldness and give them courage to do so. And Lord, I just pray if there's anyone who's, who's on the fence about knowing you and who you are, I pray that you will just reveal yourself in your word and through prayer that they have to you, God. I pray that you reveal yourself to them and, and cause the increase in their life so they can be a brother and sister in Christ and they can be welcomed into the forever family. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life and I thank you for what you're doing here in St. Kitts and here at CCF. And I pray that you're glorified through it all. In your name, amen.